And boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, we're live. It's Cameron Flash Time, which happens every single Wednesday right here on this channel somewhere down. Let me think about it. There, there should be a subscribe button. Make sure you uh, uh, do that. Press that if you haven't already and uh, grab those bell notifications while you're at it. So another week, uh, very exciting times. Before we get to uh, the two other co-hosts as well as uh, our special guests this week, a couple housekeeping notes. First and foremost, we do this every week. Really happy to see you guys here. Um, and we also have tomorrow, uh, which I'm, I mean, I don't know, maybe Jem will be doing some content on this, uh, but there's going to be a black magic, uh, live stream camera update. So that'll be very interesting to see what's going on with black magic. But today we're talking about team red Canon, the R5, the R6. Uh, first I want to say hello to Jem Schofield as well as Ben Barton. So how are you two gentlemen doing? Uh, doing well. Thank you, Matt. Perfect. I mean, Perfect. Matt, what did I say, Matt? Uh, I didn't say that. Uh oh. What did I and say? Speaking of Matt, uh, we have a guest <laughs> this week, which is really exciting. So we're going to go ahead and uh, bring him on. So, Matt Allard, the one and only. Yay. Good to see you, man. See that? Matt I is nice a, to see you guys. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Matt's a DP, or as some would say, DOP, DOP. Uh, Got to, you know, support the rest of the world <laughs> and how they say that um and then uh he also writes uh a lot for new shooter uh so pretty much i just kind of bs everybody and read his articles and then regurgitate it into a youtube video no, i'm just kidding but uh, <laughs> how you doing matt not too bad not too bad good to see you uh do you want to give everybody kind of a uh, a quick um, kind of rundown of what you do and where people can find you and read some of your content, watch some of your content. Sure, I'm a freelance DP based out of Tokyo, Japan. I've been here now for just over six and a half years. So I do a whole bunch of different types of work, whether it be um, documentaries, um, some films, narrative work, some commercials all those sort of things along those sort of lines. And also, the, um, as you mentioned, the editor of newshooter.com. So, yeah, you can obviously read all the stuff on the site or you can find me on Twitter or also um, Instagram. I don't do Facebook or those sort of things. So, uh, yeah, that's the best places to find me. Nice. Okay, perfect. Well, let's get things kicked off here and then we'll dive into our topic. Uh, we're to start with what we are all sipping on this evening. Uh, since you're our guest, Matt, what you got going on there? I should note, Matt's in Tokyo, in Japan, and uh, what time is it there again? Six something in the morning? It just hit seven, seven a.m. Seven a.m. Just past seven a.m. So okay. I'm uh, drinking something really <laughs> refreshing and light <laughs> and crisp. It's actually called Mizu, which is Japanese for water. <laughs> nice, hey, perfect. All right. Love it. And. Uh, on the other end of the time zones, we've got Ben Barnon, which is <laughs> bedtime over there. And what, what are you yeah. working on over there? I've just joined Matt into Thursday, so it's just rolled up past midnight here in the Czech Republic. Ah. So I am, uh, I'm drinking Rioja tonight, which seems to be the best thing in terms of keeping me awake for the show, but allowing me to go to sleep afterwards. So um. I'm on a Spanish uh, Rioja, uh, as all Rioja is, obviously, uh, which is a dry red. And very nice, nice. too. Lovely. Beautiful. And then Mr. Jam Schofield. What do we got? I just I just switched myself in place here. And now I'm back over here. Uh, first of all, I just want to say I'm super excited to have Matt on on the live stream. I got a text from him as I was waking up at about this what well, his time tomorrow, this time today for me, and said, What time is camera and flask? And I said 3 p.m. Pacific, and then just kind of jokingly, I said, do you want to be on the show? And he said, sure. So here we are. He's coming to us from the future, and I've known Matt for a long time. He's very modest in terms of his involvement in the community, but uh, not only a contributor and editor of New Shooter, but it's kind of uh, his baby, and also a... Uh, an incredible director of photography. His work is uh, uh, is great. Really knows his stuff. So when you're reading those war and peace reviews, 
on New Lights on News Shooter, he speaks from not only technical but also real world experience. So uh, it's awesome. I'm having um, a scotch that I don't really think I like, to be honest. I haven't decided. It's called Alexander Murray and Company Single Malt. It's a 13 year old cast strength, which I got at Trader Joe's in California. And it's eh, but I'm going to drink it again and give it a second try. That's what I'm having. And what about you, Caleb? Is that the kind Pipe? of is is that the kind of scotch that though, if you drink something else really good first, that actually becomes quite palatable after two or three? It's not horrible, like some of the shit that you drink every week or sometimes. <laughs> but it's it's uh, it's I, I, the jury's still out. No, it's not that bad. It's uh, it definitely needs a little right. water though, but it's it's okay. Cool, Caleb. What are you drinking? Uh, this week, we're back to one of my all-time favorite daily drivers, uh, dun, Templeton dun, dun. Rye. There we go. Man, I just can't and, get away from this stuff. And it's got a Caleb amount left. Clearly, clearly, you can't get away from this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Going to make a Sazerac yeah. with that thing? Let's go. Um, just a little hello to everybody in the chat. Let's just say hi to you know Shiz and Larry, and I'm sure David's in here somewhere, and we've got Adam and Jake and Sky and... A bunch of other normal people, and then some other people who are the troublemakers, and you know who you are. So we'll be watching you in the chat, boys and girls. There we go. Yes, that's what I got. I don't know what Caleb level means. Ooh, Michael P. Schmidt. Good to see you, man. He's been around for a thousand years. I feel that's since right. this whole revolution that's began. Right. Uh, speaking of revolution, first of all, cheers, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, you Fondra. folks, you gentlemen here in the uh, the actual oh, stream, and coming in right cheers. at the beginning here. Let's with with the cheers. We've got a super chat from mm. with a super sticker. Mm. It's a pear character, uh, and he's stretching his <laughs> his arm forward to offer so a cup of coffee. The quote. And I love the I love quote. the descriptive. Amazing. So thank you oh, again, man. Chiz. Great supporter. Amazing. All right. Let's start talking about cameras. Come on. Yeah, let's do it. Seven minutes in. All right. So it happened. It happened last week. The announcement we've got. We had all the rumors kind of. Um, so why don't we kick things off by um, talking about what was different? What was new? What learn from the actual release that, uh, you know, we didn't know ahead of time, which wasn't that much. It wasn't. Am I right? Am I wrong? Struggling Any opinions? It wasn't. Uh, Maybe yeah. just a couple more details about uh, certain limitations that we'll be getting into. Yeah, I mean, I think we knew less about the R6 than we knew sure. about the R5, and um, and so that was you know interesting to go over, and and then I'll have some stuff maybe to talk about a little bit later on about some of the specific video centric features that go beyond I think what the whole discussion will be with all of us and of course um, Matt you were you know you were privy to some information at least a little bit ahead of time in order to be able to publish the article which was pretty extensive right out of the gate and you kept updating it um, did the camera surprise you Yes and no. Um, I, I think it, I mean, it was interesting because you, you hear all the rumors and you, and you see all the rumors about what the camera is going to be and, what, and you know, potentially what the specifications are going to be. And then uh, you know, usually in my case, um, I'll get some information in advance, um, sign an NDA and then obviously have conference calls with Canon. So I had a variety of different conference calls with um, Canon in different places around the world. Now, I, I usually do this because one place will tell you one thing and another place will tell you something completely different. Mm. We get information from one one part of the world from Canon and the other part, they won't tell you anything about that. So the original one I had was with, with Canon USA and that was called with about 20 or 25 people. And they'll go over all the, all the sort of specifications and they'll show you a slideshow presentation, which um, you can't use any of that material that's shown on there because some of the stuff's confidential and it's stuff that they don't even publish. Um, eventually. But from that one, um, you know, they didn't really talk a lot about 
um, you know, some of the things I guess everybody's talking about now in terms of, uh, you know, overheating and recording limits, all that was kept um, very quiet and it basically wasn't even mentioned. It wasn't until I talked to another um, part of Canon in the world where I could actually have a one-on-one -on -one briefing with somebody where I could actually ask the questions that sort of I wanted to know for the article. And even then, I'm still sort of going backwards and forwards because the, the trouble is not everybody has all the information. You would think that everybody in Canada would know everything about both of these cameras. That's not the case at all. So it's of, often a case of having to go back and check information or ask questions and then they have to get back to you. So often it's them having to talk to obviously Japan to find out um, critical information or something that you're asking about to actually confirm it or say nothing about it. So it was sort of interesting. I mean, from my perspective, I guess it wasn't sort of a bit of a huge surprise. I think if you look at it from both sides of the coin, um, you know, there's stuff to like about the camera and there's some things that people are obviously going to complain about. Uh, you know, we spoil it for choice in 2020 and I always find it quite ironic that people sort of want to, you know, shoot down cameras or complain about them endlessly when what you can actually get for the money is phenomenally good, you know. And there's always going to be issues with things. I mean, a, a mirrorless hybrid camera by its very nature is something that's designed to do two jobs. An analogy I like to use is it's, it's like a toaster oven, right? You can toast and you can bake, but it doesn't do both things as well as a dedicated oven or a dedicated toaster. But you buy one because you don't have space for an oven and a toaster in your house and you just want something that does both things. That's basically a mirrorless hybrid. So you're never going to get those features you're going to get in a digital cinema camera in a mirrorless hybrid simply because of the compromises they're making because they have to actually appease both the still shooters and the video shooters. And I think, you know, in terms of the heat, one of the main reasons is probably because they needed to fully weather seal the body. So if you don't do that and you put a fan in there, you get a large proportion of people who are photographers who are going to complain and say, it's not weather sealed, why did you do this? And that's the thing. I think we forget that the majority of the people buying these cameras, a huge proportion of them are photographers, they're not doing video. Yeah. So if you upset the main market base of who the camera is sort of going to be bought by, then you risk you know, alienating people. And, mm. and I think that's the sort of compromise they've had to make. Yeah. I agree, and um, this this whole overheating thing, which I think we'll just transition into now, because that's kind of been the the hot fuss. Rip off the bandaid. Is, Rip it off. Let's yeah, do I it. know. Um, it's it's been really interesting, and I totally agree. Like you look at the presentation, it's clearly a very photo heavy camera. It's, it's the first Canon mirrorless camera that's full frame with you know big boy megapixel counts um for a lot of still shooters and uh i mean i just think it's it's hilarious the and the the one that's really gotten me is um how people are complaining about overheating even at 4k 120 not just 8k and you know i, I don't know maybe it's just me but i don't record 20 minutes of uh 4k 120 <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to think of an instance where you would actually do that and it just doesn't make any sense to me. To me, it's like, at most, maybe 10 seconds here and there, you know? And that's, of course, for, for conforming it down to 24 later. Um, so, yeah, let's dive in and talk about this whole overheating situation. So, Jem, uh, I believe you have a slide prepared. Um, yeah, this is the one. That, well, Which I'm sure uh, a lot of people have seen. Well, it's actually, I, I, I got it through, it's, it's on a number of sites, but I got it through the new shooter.com website. I believe Matt, you can confirm this, that this is something that was provided by Canon because I'm seeing it in a number of places. Um, is that yes, true? Th this was, yeah, this was sent to me in an email directly from, from Canon marketing. Um, I'm not sure if they published this up on their site. They probably have, I think by now, but that's how I first got it was, was by our email. Okay, cool. So that's the, and, and it is available in a number of places. Um, for some reason, not surprisingly, yours is the best resolution of everybody's. Some of them just look like uh, JPEG 1998. But I think we can read this pretty well in terms of the data. And then, Caleb, I'll let you kind of run the show and kind of take us through this stuff. But um, it's interesting. 
Yeah, and um, so we have, I mean, obviously we've got the two different cameras, resolution and frame rates, uh, the modes, which is uh, interesting to see a full breakdown there, and then all the shooting times. And then the real interesting, interesting stuff is the recommended scene. I think that tells you a lot about what Canon's thinking about this camera. And then at the very bottom, there's some very hard to read fine print, if you will, or bullet points, uh, footnotes. Um, so we've got, uh, I, I think one that's pretty interesting is when you're looking at the uh, 8K30, the very top line there. Uh, recommended scene, 8K productions where full frame mirrorless can be utilized to get unique angles alongside a main camera or additional cropping for 4K productions. Um, what, what was your read on, I'm not going to go through the whole thing verbally because you guys can obviously read it. But when you were looking at this, Matt, uh, is there anything that sticks out to you? In terms of the overheating? Or just, you know, thoughts on the R5, this whole situation and these limitations. Um, yeah. I, I think it's exactly as you said. I mean, I think the best way to think of the R5 is that it's a 4K camera that can shoot 8K, not an 8K camera that can shoot yeah. 4K. Now, I think that's the best way to look at it because, you know, it's almost... You should look at it as a bonus feature that's sort of, you know, like you're playing a video game and you've reached a certain level and something's been unlocked and you can use it in a limited capacity. That's that For me, that's sort of what the 8K on this camera is like. And it's exactly as you said. No, nobody is going to be shooting because of the data rates and the amount of storage you're going to need. Nobody's going to be shooting 8K for long periods of time on this camera. It, it wouldn't make sense, particularly for the market that this that this is aimed at. Uh, again, the same with 4K 120, um, you know, how many seconds are you going to shoot a 4K 120? You're not going to roll anything for 10 minutes. Right. right. Um, I, th yeah. I think the, the, the biggest probably th um, issue, I think, is you're still going to get um, heating problems doing 4K UHD or 4K DCI in the high quality mode. That's the thing. So right. the high quality mode, if you're not familiar with this, so with, with the R5, there's, there's two different ways it does 4K DCI and UHD. The first one is doing an oversample. So from the, from the sensor, I believe it's like from, from 8.2K, it downsamples to 4K DCI. And if you're doing 4K UHD, um, obviously it's cropping off the side, so that's coming from a 7.7K oversample. And then if you go into the AP, APS-C crop mode that's available on the R5, you are oversampling from 4.8K to get 4K UHD and 5.1K to get 4K DCI. So this is the highest quality form of doing 4K, or 4K DCI or UHD in this camera. So this is where you're still going to get the, those, um, those heat issues. So the only way to get rid of the heat issues pretty much entirely on the R5 is to drop down to the regular 4K UHD or 4K DCI, which is not the HQ mode. So basically, I'm still trying to confirm with Canon how they're doing this, and they are still looking into it because I don't think they've officially published it anywhere, and whether they give me an answer or not, I'm not sure. But I'm pretty sure the, the other modes are not oversampled because I've got a list of the actual modes that are oversampled. Mm -hmm. So anything else I'm thinking is probably pixel binned or line skipped. So just how that actually looks, I'm not sure. So that's something, I guess, once the camera gets out into the world and more people start using it to see if there's any real, you know, you know like a real world difference between shooting between the oversampled and obviously the, the line skipped or pixel bin version. Just what that difference in quality is going to look like. You know, who knows? We'll have yeah. to wait and see. Now, do we know or, or do you have any information on, um, so if you're just shooting like 4K high quality mode, 24 frames per second, 23, 98, maybe up to 30. Are you good to go? Is it mainly going to jump when you move up to 4K 60 and beyond? I think mainly. I, th I mean, on here, they are still saying that there is, uh, what are they saying on, the, on, on here? Well, they say if you, 4, 4K, 4K 30p, they're saying if you're APS-C crop, 5.1K oversampled, yeah, you're you're not limited, you're not by, limited heat. by heat and you're also if you're not doing oversampled 4k 30p you're not limited by heat it's when you're doing that 8.2k oversampling 
that you can run into some issues in terms of heat. Um, they're not listing 2398 on here. They're not listing 24 if you were in DCI modes. Uh, it's interesting to me, though, if you look at the R6, that uh, you have 40 minutes oh, because it's oversampling. So it's, it's any time that you're oversampling that you might run into that. So obviously that's generating more heat inside of the camera, for sure. Yeah. yeah and, I, very... I, and I don't honestly think that there's a problem here with, um, you know, I don't think that overheating is the, is the biggest issue here. It's, the issue is the downtime required. So you, oh, have to, right. you, have to, you, have to, you have to factor this in because all of these measurements have been done, obviously, in a controlled environment in a room at 23 degrees Celsius or 73 Fahrenheit. <laughs> Yeah. And this is the, they, they measured it, you know, there's a couple of guys in a lab coat have got it in a room and they're, they're running it continually to see when the, the warning light comes up. So it, uh, it's really going to depend on the environment that you're working in and where you are, because you might find that the times are actually shorter, or you may find that your camera doesn't overheat as much as somebody else's, because there's going to be variances, I think, depending on, on where you get your camera from. And so... You know, if you have to stop and then you've got the downtime and you're like, okay, now we have to wait. You, you can't put your hand up and say, oh, sorry to the client. Uh, you're going to have to wait another 20 minutes before we can roll another shot. Mm. And then, oh, by the way, we can now only roll for three minutes instead of five minutes because then it's going to overheat. And then we have to let it rest for 20 minutes instead of 10 minutes. But again, you know, it, anybody who buys this camera should now be very well aware of these limitations and you use a camera accordingly. Like, don't get something and try and use it for a job that it's not suited for. You've got no excuse if you go out on a shoot and the camera overheats and the client starts yelling at you if you know that's what's going to happen. You know, right yeah. tool for the right job. Mm, yeah. You've been and, awfully quiet there, Ben. Any thoughts on this whole thing? I, until we start getting reviews. And because I, I, we were talking just before we started here, none of us have touched this camera. We've not shot anything with it. And there's obviously very few people that have at this stage. So until we start getting reviews of people using the thing in the real world and seeing what these times are, um, exactly what Matt was saying, really, if, you, if you're aware of it and thinking about the ways that I would use both of those really as a B cam, then I think there's ways around it and you're going to work within those limitations. And skipping through those specs, there was nothing that really troubled me or put me off. Yeah. Um, but and, until, until we get real world reviews of people using them on jobs um i'm gonna hold off ordering one for sure mm -hmm. yeah i yeah. mean for me when i look at these specs they're specs right they're i mean they're real there's but 73 degrees fahrenheit 23 degrees celsius that's like ideal conditions meaning that's my perfect day is 73 degrees fahrenheit with a light breeze and what hmm. happens when you go to 79 degrees is the reason that they publish that because it gets exponentially worse when you just start going up a couple of degrees or not. I don't know. Uh, but to me, I think more importantly is what was being discussed earlier on, which has to do with the difference in picture quality between the oversampled and, and the other way that the image is being produced, depending on how you set up the camera. We already know that when you're not using the HQ fine mode that the, that the bit rates uh, decrease across the boards, it seems to be, with the camera. The question is that the, is the derived image that's being created from, uh, you know, from the camera considerably worse than the oversampled or is it just slightly worse? And, you know, people are going to be looking with eagle eyes on how sharp or not sharp the camera is when we start to deal with that. Are we adding additional issues related to moray or image degradation? Or are we getting a really fantastic image in those other modes? And we're just getting the bonus of a higher bit rate and a better image to work with in post. So that'll be interesting to see. Um, and I'm, I'm not yeah. really worried about the AK stuff. I mean, who's going to be using that? It's going to be used for crash cams and special effect shots, and it's going to be a C or a D or an E camera 
on a television show or on a movie. So I don't see a lot of people shooting 8K with this camera. I definitely don't see a lot of people shooting 8K raw with this camera. And we'll just have to see where that all goes. It's going to be a little bit of a novelty for a lot of people because people are still getting used to 4K workflows with their camera. But I hope that the 4K 120 is sharp. You know, Canon is sort of a really spotty history with um, slow motion and quality uh -huh. of picture. But, you know, these record times are very admirable. If anybody's ever owned a, an FS700, you know, we were doing tiny short bursts of high speed recording on those cameras, and I owned one for a long time. I would never in my <laughs> in, in in my right mind think about doing 4K 120p at 15 minutes. It's just uh, what does that translate to uh, in ter in terms of conform to 2398? It's just insane how much time there is of uh, slow absurd. motion there. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It so, is huge. Yeah, and with and with the the FS 700, you used to use that end record button. That's so that right. you would see whatever it was that you wanted to have happened. Yeah. And then, because it was, it had a buffer that was constantly filling and emptying, filling and emptying, and then you hit record, and it would then just write the last ten seconds to to card. Yeah, and that worked and then perfectly. Pray that whatever happened was long enough for like a cut, you know. Yeah, if that's it was right. A, something yeah. a little longer than a quick movement. You're like, oh, please be in there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Although to be honest, I I never found that lacking in time. I don't think there was ever once using that. Oh account, really? The time that I had it, that I ever had a, an issue of going. All right, I need more than that ten. That was always enough. Gotcha. Uh, Larry is saying they did all eyes coming for the R six. So I don't know if you guys wanted to keep talking about the overheating, or are you kind of over that. Well, there's there's some I, rumors I out there, but I too. I don't yeah. I don't believe rumors until I see a press release. So, you know, of course, sure. a no. day or two after the cameras were released, it's not that rumors can't turn out to be true, but there's all kinds of rumors about features that they're going to add in the future. But Canon has not said anything. So right now, to me, that's I green will say, assault. Um, yeah. Overall, just kind of backing up and doing a 30,000 foot comment. Uh, overall, I'm thrilled with what Canon's done with these two cameras. Very excited for their mentality on all you know, products with their cinema cameras, with their mirrorless cameras now. I think they're they're really headed in a healthy and very nice, you know, place with all of this. Um, and uh, even things like, you know, releasing announcements or addressing the overheating thing instead of saying, like with, when the R6 came out uh, at that event, and I totally understood what you were talking about, Matt, about, certain people tell you one thing and other people say, no, that's completely incorrect from the same company. Uh, all during that Canon EOS R event in, in Hawaii, everyone you talk to, they're like, oh yeah, no, it's, it's this. And you're like, oh great. And then you turn around and talk to another video pro and they're like, what? No, no, that's not true at all. <laughs> it's awful. But uh, yeah, very, very interested and excited to hear about where this these cameras go so anything else we want to wrap up with overheating situation before we move on nope not nope. until as okay. ben said we we hear actual reports out in the field of people putting through yeah. the camera through its paces and and seeing what they're actually getting out of it let's see what the reality yeah. of this potential problem is canon's being transparent about it let's see how it translates to the real world is my opinion yeah, somebody's still it. talking about the uh, in the chat here. I can see about the thirty-minute record limits in 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 twenty twenty. What do you guys think about it still being capped in any mode at twenty-nine minutes fifty-nine seconds? Uh, is it still the tax thing? Yeah, what's the is deal? That still what Pan is I mean, on to? why does Panasonic do it? I mean, it just seems like Panasonic can do it, and is it really hitting the bottom line that much? Right. I don't. I don't believe it's to do with the tax thing anymore. I'm pretty sure that's now ch that's changed. I don't know, Ben. You might know more about this being in the, being in I, Europe. I I know that there were certain. It, it was a territorial thing. Certainly, you no. Know, you were saying about Panasonic. A friend of mine for a very specific application. He was looking for G8. I can't remember if it was a GH3 or GH4. It was a few years ago, 
And he was looking for, I think, a US model because it didn't have the time limitation or it was from a different territory because Europe had this and it was classed as, if it was classed as a stills camera, it didn't have the tax on. If it was classed as a, a camcorder, it did. And that was that was the issue, I think, and that was what they, they put in. I have no idea whether that is still the case mm. and whether these 30 minute limits that it's got, it seems a round number on the R6. That they're talking about this this 30 minutes for the for any of the modes on the R6. So I don't know. I, I honestly don't know what the situation is with it now. Or have cannons always overheated for some reason we've never known about, <laughs> and that's been their excuse. Yeah, Sky is yeah, saying the tax other... thing. Yeah, well, Sky London saying the tax thing has stopped now. It was an EU thing, but okay. it's gone. So um, Sky Sony is usually on point. Up. Yep, yep. Although I don't it think is. they've released firmware for their older stuff, but yeah. Okay. Huh. So it'll be interesting. Yeah, I mean, I would have loved it if we had a, you know, a UHD 4K 2398, you know, and 2997 unlimited. Because let's not forget that the whole world doesn't always want to shoot at 2398 or 23976. It's not always a thing. So if we could cover 2398, 25, and 2997, I would be really happy about that. I don't think we'll see it. Um, but you know, like we've been discussing when you get into this form factor, there has to be a realistic expectation of what you can get out of the camera system to a degree. And it's, we've got it so good. And it's not as if at about $4,000 us, you have to make a gigantic leap to get into a, a great quality digital cinema camera with built in ND built in XLR and some of the other things that, you know, a lot of people want, including right. great AF systems. So we're not we're not at that point now. And I, I'd love to discuss, you know, kind of the idea of form factor and a, you know, where that sits in terms of the landscape right now. And will it be affecting decisions in terms of the equipment that people buy and use because of COVID-19 and even if this whole thing, you know, resolves itself, that's a, the worst word to say, but, you know, if mm -hmm. we go, if we go back to a situation where we're, we're not worrying about this virus, but has it already, is the writing already on the wall that the, that the FX nines and C300 Mark threes are not going to be sold in, in the same quantity and everybody's going to go and they have their quarterly or annual budgets. And they're just going to say, we're probably only going to get, uh, at best R5s, you know, or the unicorn camera or S1Hs. I don't know, you know, where this all goes yeah. in terms of everything. There's a segment for sure that I think would, it would make sense for a lot of, for, for a lot of people that are making content for social, short form factor stuff, stuff that's not, you know, interview heavy. Just in terms of form factor for portability, it's obviously amazing. But, uh, and then all the all the peripheral stuff that goes around that and how you need to rig those out. And I, I think for that element, for sure, but definitely not for, for everyone, because they are still a pain in the arse to use, having to, with the ND and the audio stuff. Hmm. You know, they, they are still they are still limited. I think there's a lot of people, I mean, for, for the sort of stuff I do, it's a fantastic B camera and I'm, I'm really excited by them. Um, but definitely, you know, and I was, you know, there's a little bit of you that just thinks, how wonderful would it be just to have like two R series bodies and all your lenses that would all fit in my one little backpack and, and that would be it. And I could save my back and not be doing that. And then, then you actually start thinking through your shoots and the jobs that you've done in the last few months and you go, no, 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 no. It's, it's still, that's still going to cause you an awful lot of going back to the old days, you know, when we started using the, the, the five D2s and then it's the separate audio recorders again and all, all it gets to all that, this little camera that then, you know, you start needing to build out yep. too much. So I think, I think it is, there's definitely an element. There's definitely a a, a type of uh, of crews that are going to go down that route, and it, mm. it makes sense. But I don't think they're necessarily people that have been using cinema cameras and are downscaling. I think they're people that have always been using GHs and uh, and mirrorless you know, for the last few years. Anyway, there's a lot of those guys around. Matt, do you see? Um, I mean, when obviously this is this these two cameras are two of the biggest camera announcements that have come out in quite some time. I mean, we have had the C500 Mark II last year, C300 Mark III, you know, there hasn't been a lot 
hopefully there'll be some more stuff coming up. But do you see a lot of eyeballs and not forget about eyeballs. Do you think that a lot of people are going to be buying these cameras instead of digital cinema cameras? Or are they realistic to understand where they actually fit in the overall scope of things? It's like Ben said, I think it entirely depends on what you're doing and what level you're at. I'm sure these cameras are going to sell like hotcakes. And for a lot of situations, you know, if, as you're saying, if you're just doing videos for social and things along those sort of lines, perfectly fine. I can see companies not wanting to spend big money if they don't have to because they're not going to get a huge, big, noticeable difference, particularly if it's in control conditions. I think once you reach a sort of certain level, I think I don't see people actually, you know, getting rid of, say, their FX9 or their C300 Mark II or Mark III to go and buy a R5 or an R6 and use that as their, their primary camera. I think most people are probably smart enough to realise that there's going to be limitations uh, you know, around that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. particularly, uh, you know, we were having this conversation the other day, Jim. I think the biggest thing here and, and something that maybe Canon have overlooked is this was a prime time to release some, some type of um, XLR module box oh, yeah. audio interface. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Because they don't have the intelligent MI shoe like Sony or Panasonic has. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, you have to put something on the top and then you've got to run it in to the side of the camera. But there's no reason they couldn't do something and modify that existing little box that they've got that you can use with the C300 Mark II, I think it is, or the C200? It, it, it well, it, it, well it, work, it works with the C300 Mark II C, uh, and the C200, and it's the MA400 XLR unit, which is basically when you take away the clamshell from the C300 Mark II, um, what you can do is you can separate and you can get that that uh, touchscreen monitor from the C200, and then you can get the MA400, which is just a dedicated with that audio cable um, audio unit. And absolutely, why didn't they design something like that that could go into the hot shoe? Uh, I mean, I've talked to Caleb about that more than once that Panasonic and Sony are the only two companies in the mirrorless space that are addressing audio kind of properly in the in a, in a whole ecosystem, I think. But yeah. Hmm. Well, and I Time suppose going too. back to what, yeah. And, and the, what we were saying about the ND and Canon's got that really nice solution with their adapter that has the built-in ND, hmm. which makes that a lot, uh, a lot easier to use and particularly gives you a much wider selection of lenses. It's a much more flexible system rather than being having to use screw-ins or be using matte boxes. So I think that, that combined with an audio unit that was going to give you XLR inputs as well would have been a very smart move. Yeah. To show Real you. quick, uh, YC Imaging, good to see you, brother, uh, in the chat. Uh, wicked skills uh, yes. in production, music videos, great channel. Good to see you, man. Lanta base um, right now. Yep, yep. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. Audio. Well, th that kind of brings up an interesting question. Do you think Canon will kind of put something in between the C300, 500, and this R5? Like, do you think there's room for a 1DC Mark II with a fan, essentially an R beefed up R5? Or I was thinking the other day, what if they took like the 1DX, put a fan in it? And or or a really fat heat sink, and then gave us you know I don't know I could see AK them do it. they could like definitely they could definitely do it I don't think they will I mean I think right now the question is whether or not the C two hundred at some point gets a replacement because you know we talk about some of the advancements that have happened with their digital cinema cameras there's definitely been some you know some some changes. And historically, if you really compare, compared to the newer sensors, two compared in there, three, uh, it, they're, not, they're not as sharp as some of the cameras out there. And sharp isn't always good, but I mean, if you really look at the C300 Mark II nowadays, compared to even some of these mirrorless cameras, it is not the sharpest camera out there in the world. And um, I don't know. I, I don't know where they're gonna take this. They're definitely gonna ride this R5, R6, train for a while. I don't I don't personally see them going 
into another one. They've got the 1DX Mark III already, which again for still shooters is the sports, you know, uh, high frame rate, you know, reigning, legend. yeah, legend. Oh. So, um, there's rumor that they're going to do another DSLR, another 5D. I don't know why they would necessarily, but we should acknowledge the fact that one of the weakest things inside of the you know the the RF line right now is the lens lineup. It's not that there are no lenses, but as you were saying, Ben, you know, being able to adapt EF lenses is sometimes better. Not only do you open up the whole family of lenses, but you have those you know those adapters that let you put ND inside of there. So I don't know. Yeah, that's one thing that's always if we can talk about lenses for a second. One thing that's always kind of bugged me is everyone's always like, I'm not interested in these RF cameras because the lenses are super expensive. Mm. And people, I don't know if people just don't understand that these cameras are literally both RF and EF. Yep. Yeah. And, and three and incredible adapters. And when you put the adapter on, it pretty much, I mean, the R5 will turn into a 5D that does 8K. Lens-wise. That, yeah. Like, it's the exact no same thing as having a Canon. There's no performance drop-off with those adapters. Zero performance drop-off. Um, and in fact, there's almost, it's almost better to use older Canon lenses because again, you get a new, you get another control ring, you know, which you can have on the lenses as well. But then you get what Ben was just talking about the adapters and who knows what other adapters they might come out with in the future. Or, um, what I'm hoping for is, um, some company to, you know, come out with an ND if they can figure out the engineering without getting into legal trouble to do an electronic ND adapter of some kind using that option. So to me, like it's the same as it was before it, it's just, it, to me, it's like the EF lens line, except now we have these like, you know, a whole new branch of lens options. Right. So just a little PSA for everybody out there <laughs> who's thinking they, they have to go RF. And I think yeah, all this, four this of us, thing are, with, yeah. with any camera, go ahead. This is Sorry. the thing with, with, with any camera manufacturer is that you don't lose somebody with, with them buying another camera. You lose somebody when they change a lens ecosystem. Yep. So when Canon sort of dropped the ball, whatever it was, four or five years ago, and a lot of people switched over to Sony, they went E-mount. So by going E-mount, you're probably buying a lot of native Sony glass. So the prop, the, it's not a problem of going, okay, I'd love to just jump over from now back from Sony to Canon, people look at it and go, well, I've got all this glass. I can't use any of it on this new camera. Uh, what do I do? I either have to sell everything and start again mm. because you might have ended up selling all your EF glass be and, and, and gone native native um, Sony. So that's the thing. It's once you invest into a, into a lens system, you're sort of getting yourself stuck into a position. So that's right. it's almost the, the best option to go with something where no matter what the camera you have, you buy a lens accordingly that, you know, if you're thinking long term, that can work on across multiple cameras or multiple systems because it's not going to matter. Because if you go with a mount that's obviously adaptable with a short flange depth, then if you're buying, say, you know, old vintage glass or Nikon, Nikon glass or whatever like that, you can adapt it. Yep. And you can keep it and work across any of these cameras. Whereas if you go one that's a dedicated system, and, and I think that's sort of almost the, the, tra the trap that Canon fell into with EF, and maybe they should have gone RF, started developing RF a lot earlier because EF is not very easily adaptable to a lot of other camera systems. Yes, you can get adapters for certain for certain cameras and things like that, but it's hard to put them onto onto other systems. Hmm. They do have that, and, they, and let's let's be honest, the RF lenses they're coming out with. I mean, you look at Sony, who kind of has a small you know, opening for their, their, this is awkward, their <laughs> camera body E-mount. And then you've got Nikon, who's really not done too much with their Z-mount. Uh, but Canon has come up with some really interesting lens designs, fully taking advantage of what the RF and what a large mount with a short flange distance can do. And so I think they're being super smart with that because there's some serious features that um, they're going to sell people on with the, the compactness of the lenses 
and the features they have. Uh, it's it's pretty wild. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, it's kind of weird with EF because it's sort of a a two sided conversation. On one hand, you know, because Sony went with E mount and some of these other companies, including now Canon with RF mount, have gone with such a short flange distance the ability to choose other lenses from other manufacturers becomes humongous. And I think that that was a partial savior in some ways for Canon, not because they had the right camera system, but because they had the actual lenses that could easily be adapted to so many of these different cameras. But we're in a different yeah. world now where when we talk about E-mount, the number of native E-mount lenses that exist on the market are enormous it used to be there were you know a few sony lenses and then a couple of manufacturers started making e-mount lenses and now pretty much any new lens that comes to market within reason outside of the cinema space and even in the cinema space sometimes will be uh, offered in an e-mount but at the same time the disadvantage to going with e-mount or any of these mirrorless cameras with a short flange distance is if you buy native glass for those cameras, you can be very much locked into the lenses that are there. So for a lot of people who are now sitting there with an E-mount camera system with lots of native E-mount glass, and now they wanna make the switch to some other camera system with a different mount, it's gonna be very hard to adapt or impossible to adapt those native E-mount lenses to a camera system. Uh, with a different mount. Not impossible maybe for certain cameras, but it's you don't see a lot of E-mount lenses being used on anything other than E-mount. So that is also you know a real part of the conversation that people need to consider and think about, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, so we have a little less than 15 minutes left. Yeah. Um, Unless you guys want to talk about something else. I know, Jem, you have a couple items. Actually, we'll, maybe we'll get to that. Just some, wrap up some more video stuff with these two cameras. But I thought it'd be kind of interesting to touch on uh, with this Canon announcement. I feel like a lot of companies are getting really busy. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Uh, it'd be interesting to chat about maybe, you know, what we might be seeing slash what this is doing to the industry, if you will. Uh, but first, Jem, you had mentioned... Uh, offline that you had a couple um you know items when it comes to other features that aren't you know making people lose it in forums yeah i don't want to go crazy on this I'll, I'll keep the i'll keep it really short because we have to see what happens when the cameras come out but we've got some things like vertical video shooting mode in the cameras so for people who are creating signage i think that's pretty interesting um, there's the focus guide that comes from the Cinema EOS cameras that when you're using your lenses in manual mode, which is exceptional for focus right. confidence. And I, I love that. Um, the zebras or zebras go below 50. So you can set them to 40 or 45. Thank yes. Clap, clap, clap. It's so unbelievable how no one does that. 50 or 60 every I've time. been asking I've been asking Fujifilm to do it for well since the X-T3 came out because if you throw a gray card up and you've got you know zebras up and you can set it to 40 or 45 why can't you use that tool to judge you know where where exposure should be for middle gray in certain situations it can it can help um, there's also an 8k screen grab feature in the R5 and a couple other little things that are there those are the ones that really stand out to me. I'm curious about this quote unquote video clarity control option that's inside of the camera. We'll see what that kind of BS is all about, but uh, you know, I'm happy to check it out. You gotta, you gotta put some things in there uh, for the marketing sheet, I guess. Maybe it's usable, nice. but uh, that's, that's, you know, maybe you need that when you're not doing the oversampling. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what that is. So we'll see. Perceived, perceived, you know, you, you boost your uh, contrast when you're not using the oversampled mode so that you give a perceived sharpness in the image. Maybe that's why we're using video clarity control. I yeah. don't know. I'm just making that up as, as I go along. So there you go. Just yeah. something to do with the, with the HDMI output as well on, 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 the R, on the R5 is if you take an HDMI signal out, it will put out 422 10-bit yep. over yep. there up to 4K 60. 
Now, what you need to be aware of is that you can't internally record at the same time as you're externally recording, mm. and you will lose the back screen on the camera. Ah, so, oh, you oh you snap. Your touch, your, touch fo your, your touch focus goes mm. uh, when you do that. I'm not sure why that's... I, I'm pretty sure it does that on the, on the R6 as well, but I'd have to confirm that, so... Uh, so, somebody yeah, just that's, somebody that's just not, dropped a bomb. A toe in the Sony pool over that's there. That's almost like a that's almost like a camera and flask exclusive. I haven't read that anywhere. Maybe it's not exclusive, but uh, that was not information that I ingested into my tiny little brain. So uh, that's that's interesting. Wow, Matt, Matt you need to start a, a another YouTube channel or, or do a video and be one of those sensationalist YouTubers. <laughs> you know, yes, uh, this. The HDMI secret that no one's telling you about, or that Canada doesn't want you to know. Something absurd. Uh, right, so uh, we've got a couple comments here. Uh, Shiz won't stop talking about his silly Sony Z, uh, Z, FZ, ZF, whatever, NZ. <laughs> we, know, we know that and, Caleb's uh, a huge but, fan. Yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, Gregory is very interested to have us talk about the uh, Black Magic announcement, mm -hmm. um, which is tomorrow. And um, that kind of brings us to why don't we do this really quickly as we kind of dial down here. Maybe we'll jump into the chat some more. <laughs> 360 grad. Um, first of all, what does Sony have to do with the unicorn to uh, stop the masses from jumping train? Well, match it. They just have to match it, don't they? If you if you already got, and we were talking about the lenses. If you're invested into their lens system, if, as long as you get somewhere close to this, you're going to retain the people that you've got. I would say it's or, fair, it's pretty much as simple as that, is it not? Four two two know, ten though. bit internally. That's all they need to do. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> basically that's it. That that all yeah. silence. 80% of the people who are complaining. I think that's yeah. and for most people, that's all that they need. And the decent codec. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. I mean, if you take the A7 III, which has already got one of the best autofocus systems out there for sure, and you put 10-bit 422 at something other than, you know, dog's ass, you know, 100 megabits per second, then then you have a you have something that people want. I mean, if you put a a 200 and a 400 inside of there, like Panasonic and Fujifilm have. Fine H.265, HVEC, uh, you know, 4K up to 60, great. If they do 120, fine. But as long as it's doing those things, I agree. And look, we would love it if you have an 8K camera, if you had a 5 or 6K option. That would have been nice. But we can always have a wish list. And, and mainly only because... So many of us are so used to this whole, oh, let's shoot in 4K and finish in 1080. So is there an advantage to having 8K and finishing in 4K? Right now, not with these cameras, with their overhead and what there is there. But it does give you the same punch in, you know, uh, capabilities that you would have. You have so, no uh, yeah. imagination, Jim. What do you mean? No imagination. What does that mean? 16 Tell me. 16 camera angles. When you're finishing with when you shoot with AK, finishing. Is that going to be next week's video? Come on, video? man! Dream. Is that your next video? It. Come on! Uh, you're crazy. No, I'm just, you're, you're always talking about 4K <laughs> to 10, 1080. Well, I mean, well, just the because with that whole uh, no, to HD I, I keep talking about that because so many people in the real world are in that workflow. They're taking their cameras and they're shooting in UHD 4K, and they're finishing their videos in 1080. That's what's happening in the corporate world, you know, and they're shooting their, think, yeah, they're my, doing it. My work's that. That's what people are doing. Um, so, you yeah. know, it's it's not that, it's not, and unfortunately, because people are so used to doing that, they're also used to the fact that they get sloppy with composition and everything else. I've done it for sure. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying everybody else are the only people doing it. But the reality is that, uh, you know, that's why people are interested in, in 6K sensors, because it gives them a little bit of extra room to work with in post, I think, for most people. Nobody's pushing 6K content out to the web. And if they want to push out UHD 4K, they're using that extra resolution to to move it around a little bit to you know find where they yeah. want their frame to be. So I, I don't know. Yeah. I, yeah. But um, 
We'll see. We're not. Um, we're probably not getting autofocus with Black Magic tomorrow. I'll tell you that. But we'll probably get a six or an eight K right. sensor. <laughs> just, just before we go on to Black Magic, do you think that you're going to order either of these cameras? Sorry. Do you think are any of you going to order one of these two uh, cameras? I'll let the so, others so, go first, and then I'll answer with kind of it ties into a chat question here. Okay. okay. Jim. Uh, I'm still happy with the X-T4 and X-T3, but I am interested in the AF capabilities as a one-person shooter for certain types of production. I'm, I'm more interested not in just the standard AF, but how well it detects. It's obviously people. Does it have object detection or can you lock things in? I haven't read anything about that. One of the things that I struggle with when I'm shooting with a gimbal, if I'm doing certain types of stuff, is can I draw a box around something and have it track it? And, you know, we all know that face or people detection is, is not always great. There's supposedly a head detection feature inside of the camera with oh. the Canons. And if that really worked, that would probably do the trick for me if it if it worked. But then what happens when you're shooting sure. in log? You know, is it going to once you go low contrast, is it going to be able to latch on to things? Are we still going to have problems with glasses and beards and with darker skin tones when we start to get into, you know, situations where, um, you know, what? what my friend uh, you know, from Canon used to say is, is kind of gray matter where the camera can't detect any kind of contrast and it can't latch on and use the AF system properly. I don't know, we'll have to see. But, uh, but if, it, if it does AF incredibly well, then the R5 seems interesting to me. I think that the R6 less so for the type of things that I'm doing and probably mainly because I wanna look for those higher bit rates and maybe this oversampling but you know jury's out until we see the camera mm. matt you're a man's man rocking what are you still shooting on the sony Amira. f35 no, Amira. he's an Amira boy over there come on oh big yeah, yeah okay big guns you, do you have time um, for these silly little mirrorless cameras I still use them occasionally for certain certain applications. I've been using the the S1H occasionally for stuff where I've got to go and shoot things where permits are required, and I can't obviously take a larger camera in there. So that's that that's been what I've been using for that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I don't really have any plans to buy either of these cameras. I mean, if I have to buy one to do a review, obviously, I'll do that to have a look at it. Um, it's just not sort of a camera that's probably going to for the type of work that I do is something I'm going to need, but you know, I'm, I'm happy to look into it. And if something, suddenly there's something amazing about it and it does something that maybe I need, then maybe I'll look at it again. Got it. Um, so YC imaging, uh, says I'm honestly interested in knowing if a big percentage of people switched changing ecosystems is hell for the average person, which I agree. Mm -hmm. Uh, and my answer to the question, uh, will I be ordering? I have ordered both, uh, and I'm mm. frantically selling a bunch of cameras and gear. So if anyone needs <laughs> anamorphic adapters or lenses or a couple camera bodies or <laughs> monitors or any stuff like that, let me know. Um, but uh, I think there's what's special about this is I agree it's really painful to move from one mm. ecosystem to the other. But I think a lot of people grudgingly move to Sony, and there's a whole, there's honestly an entire generation of people that started out on a Canon camera and they get warm, fuzzy feelings when they see those menu systems. Like, so to go home, people would be willing to make the switch. Hmm. And so Sony's sure. going to have to do a lot, I think, to retain slash, you know, continue to grow. And we've kind of been talking about like working professionals, um, you know, people in the industry, but we got to remember there's millions of people out there kind of starting the next generation of how we consume entertainment. And a lot of those people are people in their bedrooms who started with a T2I, a 5D. And so uh, I think, you know, there's, it's going to be really interesting. I can't wait to see the graphs of, you know, 
the camera market that those rumor sites always share. Uh, it's going to be interesting for sure. Uh, looks like we got a super chat there. There Mr. it is. Jem Schofield. It's all going to Benjamin is uh, super chat. Thanks to Matt for waking up early. So basically, yes. I basically I owe you a drink, Matt, next time I see you or or something. A Might meal. Be a while. Yeah. <laughs> I see. I'll see you in 2022. Yeah. In a, NAV 2022. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I just said. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it ain't gonna be Hopefully. next year, is it? <laughs> I don't yeah. think so. Oh man. My, I, I so think the chances are slim. On that unfortunate note. Uh oh. Uh, at least we have this opportunity to spend time together digitally. I want to thank you all for hanging out with us. Especially thanks uh, to Matt for getting up early, spending some time with us. Appreciate it, Matt. Thanks so much for coming on. Absolutely. I promise. Yeah. Thank you, man. <laughs> nice, man. <laughs> uh, very much appreciated. Uh, and guess what? If you're just tuning in now, there's 71 of you. Uh, I hope that all of you have hit the subscribe button down there. Make sure you have done that because guess what? We're going to be back next week. And it's going to be a blast. It is. Jen, any, anything we should know about next week or final closing closing words here as we wrap this puppy up? Just a big thank you to Matt for being on, uh, sharing his thoughts and being here early, but also just, uh, you know, if, you, if you've never heard of Newshooter.com, uh, go back to the rock that you live under because, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but I mean, if we're talking about industry news, there's only a couple of places out there for the stuff that we want to find out about. And my first source is always Newshooter. So thank you to... Uh, to Matt, to Eric, and everybody over at the New Shooter team. Thank you for for uh, the most in-depth reviews and coverage of the equipment that we look at. And rest assured, when something comes out that's big, you'll get the initial post on the site, but then there'll be a follow-up with very, very, very in-depth coverage of what the equipment is but also uh, perspective when it comes to using that equipment in the real world. So I appreciate that, Matt. Thank you very much for being here this week. Hopefully you, you'll come back at some point. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. And Mr. Barden, any closing?